Hello, I'm Mark Lamus. I'm the artistic director of the Westport Country Playhouse, and we are currently offering our streaming platform. Uh, we're offering our production of, of Mice and Men, which was the very first show I did at this historic theater um, 13 or 14 years ago now. And I'm happy to be in conversation with a tremendously gifted colleague of mine, Paul Lazarus, who did his own production of the play about a year before we did ours at Pasadena Playhouse in California. And uh, the reason I asked Paul to chat with us today, chat with me today, is that when I got the offer to do uh, Of Mice and Men here, it was before I was artistic director, I started Googling uh, around looking for um, reviews and articles and you know background on the play and up popped a number of raving rave reviews for Paul's production. And so I wanted, and he did a very interesting thing with the way he cast it and shaped the concept of the production, extremely different from ours. And I wanted, I wanted Paul to talk about that a little bit uh, because it turns out it was based on historical fact. Paul, welcome. Thank, Thank you, you for doing this. And um, to be here. I'd love to hear how you conceived of the show when you did it? Uh, well, the artistic director at the time at the Passing of Place, which is which had been a job of mine uh, a few years before, was a, a dear colleague of mine and, and a friend of yours named Sheldon Epps. And he he literally said, uh, "Why don't you come back to the Playhouse and direct a production of, of Mice and Men?" And frankly, I was a little crestfallen and I was a little chagrined by the whole thing because I. I'm not a big fan of directing productions that a lot of people have done very well uh, because it's difficult to follow in those uh, footsteps and it's difficult to put or have any kind of individual feeling about it. And, and I, so ultimately I, I was about ready to say no. And um, I was very fortunate at the time that I had a, uh, an assistant named Andres Martinez, who was Hispanic. And I don't remember the initial conversation, but somewhere, I think it was with my wife, we were talking about, you know, this is a play where there are laborers and contemporaneously, most laborers are, most laborers, frankly, in LA, especially Los Angeles, are Mexican. And I thought, oh, what it, would it be interesting to maybe cast all of the workers as Hispanic, or I guess now the term is Latinx, and, and, and have the other cast be typical Caucasian. And uh, I started getting that idea and I happened to bring it up with my assistant. And he said, do you know about the Bracero program? Which I did not have any idea about. But in 1942, roughly, it was really a World War II program to replace all the, the men going off to fight in World War II, uh, mostly in the middle you know, agricultural belt of California, we were importing uh, Mexican laborers to work the fields. And this just blew my mind because I thought, wait a minute, this is, this is in Steinbeck territory, but the workers are all Mexican laborers, braceros. And I started doing a little more and more research about that. And then we found a book of, of photos of Braceros and it looked like Steinbeck. And I realized, okay, that's, that's the play I wanna do. And, and that makes it now fresh for me and a little different. And it starts to suggest things like there's a different kind of jeopardy and about the play because now you could be sent home. You know, it's a, it's raising the stakes. And I thought, but um, anyway, so I, I started off with that and that then it then I started to get intrigued and and uh, I started to see the play completely with new eyes. And I realized, wait a minute, maybe maybe some of the language should be Spanish, <laughs> but maybe maybe when the white boss walks in, everybody has to stand up mm -hmm. because we could be sent home to Mexico and we don't wanna be sent home to Mexico. We wanna, we wanna get our paycheck and send it back to our wives in Mexico. And, and it, it changed the whole play, but what I, what I, the whole cast and I agreed 
we wanted to do the play. We didn't want to put our spin on the play and make it a different play. We actually wanted to do the play. Yeah. And yeah. so there was a lot of emphasis on let's not rewrite this play. Let's just see it with it, slightly new eyes. And, you know, I guess um, what I'm proud of is I think we did of Mice and Men. But sure. we put, you know, I don't think we changed of Mice and Men. We didn't make any new version of it. We did of Mice and Men, but I think Seinbeck would have liked our production. That I hope. <laughs> oh, I'm sure he would. I mean, he, I, I can't imagine that he wouldn't have. I was so uh, jealous, as I think I told you in an email, when I read these reviews, not because they were rave reviews, because as you say, there are many fine productions that existed of this play, but that brilliant idea of, uh, of, of these migrant workers being Mexican uh, rather than Caucasian, it just spoke to so much. And I thought, I'd love to steal this, but I can't, <laughs> I can't do that to a colleague. Well, um, I, I, I appreciate someone as, as good a director as you are uh, both saying that and doing that because, uh, you know, it, it, these ideas don't hit you very often. Uh, you know, yeah. they, are, they don't come along like, you know, gifts. They, uh, there was a lot of, and it also, um, it forced me to do many different things. It forced me to see the play with fresh eyes and it, it allowed for a kind of uh, uh, prejudice about who did it. I purposefully avoided my usual gang and went to people that perhaps I had never used before. And, and I felt the whole play benefited from that. that. I found that too in the last few years to say to my teams of two or three folks that I love working with all my life, you know, I'm gonna, I'm gonna, do, I'm gonna put together new teams of designers. And especially if it's a diverse team, you have so much more, uh, you have such interesting focuses coming from these folks on on the on the work that you're doing. Um, our our production began um, for me. I got a phone call from uh, someone at the Playhouse who said uh, we are planning to do a production of Mice and Men directed by Paul Newman, who was married to Joanne Woodward, who had renovated the Playhouse and was now the artistic director. Uh, and uh, she said to me, Paul is very ill. He has cancer. We're not sure he's going to be able to pull through and do this. We sort of gave it to him as a kind of lifeline and he wanted to really do it. But would you be interested in doing it if, if he's too ill? And I said, yes. And I said, this is completely confidential. I said, okay. And I had another gig kind of lined up at another theater that I loved. And I called the artistic director there and said, I have an opportunity to do something. I know I haven't signed a contract yet. Could I possibly get out of this if this comes along? And she was very gracious. She said, yeah, well, oh. bingo, I got a call. And he, he was too ill and I had to start casting and designing immediately. Wow. And it was very, very late for, you know, for the production. And, um, but I jumped at it because when I had been running the Hartford Stage Company, I produced the play. Mary Robinson did a very fine production of it there. And I always, it was kind of a bucket list play for me. I thought, I love this play. I wish I'd get a chance to do it. And, um, and through sad circumstances, I did get a chance to do it. Yeah, it's such a strong play. I mean, oh. and, and, and the book is, is, is such a, a good yeah. read. I mean, I guess, I guess he did, I guess Steinbeck did the adaptation, the original adaptation, which is great. Well, you know, I read somewhere that it's more likely that um, that Kaufman did it. Oh. That Steinbeck said to him, I'm not that interested in writing the actual play. Oh. But, and then Kaufman, the original director of Kaufman, the Kaufman and Hart fame, George S. Kaufman. Right. Uh, no slouch himself. <laughs> no slouch said, let me take a whack at it and see if you approve but it would mean meaningless if my name were attached to it as the writer because you're the Pulitzer Prize winner and it's a great novel by you. And apparently that's that was the gentleman's agreement that, we worked out. That sounds right. <laughs> because the play is so locked tight, isn't it? The way it's written is a yeah. real playwright. You know, you, yeah, the first time I read the play, I thought, why didn't Steinbeck write 10 more plays? You know, this thing is just brilliant. 
Um, that actually makes total sense I know. That, that Kaufman did the editing because uh, it, it is so much the book, but it is beautifully edited. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I, I loved the book. I had never read it. I know a lot of people read it in school, in high school and college, and I'd never read it until I started to work on my production of the play. And it so influenced how I directed it and heard heard it, you know. Oh, I, I think the book it. is very informative. We. We we often went back to the book and the also also uh, I I was just re I this interview reminded me of we made one change to the language other than occasionally throwing in Spanish that we we were certain that the audience would understand the Spanish so for example when lunch happened we would say comida comida and ring the bell we mm -hmm. knew everybody would understand that comida meant lunch. So that's the kind of Spanish we put in. But I do remember there was one, one thing that I, uh, I am guilty of changing the play of. It was because the Braceros, it was a very well-known controversy that the Mexican workers were given short hoes to harvest sugar beets. And, uh, you know, it's a little difficult to imagine, but when you give in a short hoe, you have to bend over to the ground. Well, it's okay to do that for five minutes, but when you do it all day, it can literally destroy your back. Mm. And th there are many, many braceros who had back problems because <laughs> of this practice yeah. of giving the short hoe instead of the long hoe. And uh, it was the one addition we made to the uh, script. We put in uh, that they were going to go harvest sugar beets with short hoes because I just I felt that. it. It's and I just felt, coach. and it became the poster too, uh, uh, which we could show later. But uh, uh, it became, the, yeah, that's there the, it is. yeah, that is a that is literally a picture of a bracero. Look at that! I mean, holding a short hoe, and you can see how stooped his back is. Can you imagine doing that for eight, ten hours? No, I mean, no. No. you 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 don't you don't you can't uh, you can't imagine. So no. we put that in, but. Uh, but the, the real secret was the ability to cast these astonishing, you know, when you, when you draw on the same pool of actors, you're limited. And, but what was interesting is I had some of the most superb, uh, well, just great actors, you know, just to say that the superb Latin actors, uh, Hispanic is, is, a, is not uh, acceptable to me. They were just great actors, but, Wow, what a pool came in to audition for this production. Yeah, you know, a few quite a few years ago, I was directing, I was asked to direct Taming of the Shrew at Yale Rep, speaking of this. And I got this idea that I I, I didn't want to see a woman slapped around on stage. So I thought, what if I do an all-male production of Taming of the Shrew? What would, you know, what would the resonances of that be, et cetera? And then I got the idea, what if it were all Latin X men? Um, and I don't quite remember where this came from, but it was, it, believe me, it was grounded in some idea that was in the <laughs> And I had the same thing happen. Uh, you know, actor after actor would come in, no one I'd ever seen before would come into audition for me. And they were all dressed in this very odd way. They looked like criminals. They were, they looked like people you'd be frightened of meeting in an alley. And finally I said to two of them sort of jokingly, who I saw in the hallway, I said, why are you guys, like, you really look kind of scary. What's this about? And they said, all we get cast as are rapists and, and killers. Mm. That's why we're so excited to to audition for you. It was heartbreaking. Mm. You yeah, know? I know. Uh, it's, it's and, a, you know. I'm on my way to a TV audition where I rape somebody and kill her child or something like that. Right. You know? I'm dressed like this. Um, but it was a huge eye opener. <laughs> I thought, yeah, um, pigeonhole. You know. It's so pigeon, and uh, and uh, you know, and frankly, I think I had a better qual, <laughs> I had a better level of actor uh, auditioning yeah. for that production because of making that that dis that original decision. Um, I'm sure you did. And well, and I'm sure they were more invested in it than than just actor actors. They were so they must have been so invested in your concept. Yeah, and 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 I think that's I think that was what uh, made me alive to it as well was that we weren't seeing it as a directing a production of of mice and men. We were directing our production of of mice yeah. and men, and yeah. it became it became both personal and 
everybody was highly motivated. It was, uh, in fact, I don't think I've ever had a cast be as personally invested in a theater production as that group. Mm -hmm. It was a very, it was a very moving experience in that respect. I'm sure we had the same kind of experience with Man of La Mancha, which we cast an all Latin X company, and it 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 took me right into the piece. Like you originally with Mice and Men, I didn't really feel like I wanted to direct Man of La Mancha. I didn't think I just thought it was kind of a cliche, but to to have a cast full of Latin X people in a play about being in a prison. I mean, the whole thing takes place in a prison. They're in prison. Right. Um, and it was happening. We were rehearsing and performing uh, during the whole crisis at the border under Trump. So it was particularly resonant for everybody, including them, uh, some of whom had relatives there, you know, in Mexico. And and uh, it was they invested this this old musical with such personal uh, feeling, you know, that they, they actually said it's like we're telling our own story. And it took the it took the production to a whole other level that I would never have been able to achieve with a, a, a mixed race cast or, a, or an all white cast. It was, it was a wonderful moment mm. for me, too. very moving. Yeah. Um, before we close, we have about 10 more minutes or so, seven or eight more minutes. I'd love to just touch on the, some of the themes of Mice and Men and hear your feelings about them or if you think they, there are others. I mean, for me, I was just taking notes this morning I was very interested in in the themes of loneliness, of of innocence, uh, dreams, uh, and also I was interested in uh, the the way masculinity sort of was depicted in the play. How uh, Crooks, the one black character in the play, is ostracized. He's not living in the bunkhouse with the other men. Um, then you have Lenny, who is mentally challenged in some way that's never quite explained and never labeled. Uh, and then you have this kind of, I would just say, a love story between uh, George and Lenny, this man who takes care of this other man. They take care of each other. So I found the, the, the intersectionality of those themes to be very enticing for me. I wondered where you kind of... Uh, uh, what resonated for you in the play? Yeah, I mean, uh, well, first of all, you, you know, you're you're dealing with a writer who every time he writes something, crosses all of those uh, areas, and 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 it was it was it was lovely to work on a script where at any given moment of the the production of, of the play, he's touching into all of those areas, and you know, the other thing is obviously with. Uh, an all Latinx cast, especially in the workers, um, you get into ownership. And the idea of having a casita or a house, you know, to look forward to spoken by a Latinx actor versus a Caucasian is really interesting. And so we, we, we cross into, we realize that, oh my God, we're, we're, we're you know, the, in, in, I guess in 37, which is when the play was done uh, originally. In 37, I imagine that the jeopardy of a worker talking to the boss's uh, uh, wife, I guess, um, um, there's real stakes there. You know, and, and when you have a group of Latinx actors playing the workers, and they're now talking to the Caucasian wife of, the, of Curly, um, I guess it, it brought back that tension. Yeah. So, it, and, and, and I realized, oh my God, there's jeopardy here just because of who they are. Mm -hmm. Right. Mm -hmm. uh, it, and it's, and it's jeopardy. I think like they felt in 37, you know, I, I, because of, I think in our modern ethos, we don't really treat workers that way. You know, like uh, uh, a Caucasian worker, who's talking to the boss's uh, wife, whatever. Uh, it's not the same mm -hmm. as a Mexican laborer talking to the boss's wife. And so we realized we, we'd somehow captured 1937 in a, in a post 2000 production. Yeah. And, and that, that got very exciting. So all of those themes and, and uh, which are absolutely, and I love the fact that you said love story between um, 
between George and, and Lenny because there's almost no way to explain that relationship other than as a love story mm -hmm. because it, 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 he could have easily walked away from having to care for this obviously disabled human being mm -hmm. um, and doesn't, sticks it out, even to the point of making perhaps the hardest possible decision at the end of the play, you know, um, to basically kill him um, yeah. and to, to, to spare him from what could have come otherwise. And uh, so, you know, I, I was very fortunate. I was blessed to have someone like David Neronia playing that role mm -hmm. because he seemed to understand it beyond what I did, I think. Mm -hmm. Oh, that's such a great way of putting it. That's how I felt with La Mancha. I felt like they had a take on it that I could never have found. They had a take on it, which I could never have directed. Uh, it, it was profound and so personal. So I could completely get that it would it would infiltrate a play as powerful as Mice and Men. Um, and they refused, and they refused to allow me to betray the concept, which I don't think I've ever had a cast as possessive of a concept that I brought, where they taught me, like, no, 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 no. We are doing Steinbeck. We are not changing Steinbeck. Mm -hmm. We are doing Steinbeck. And they were they were religious about that. If I if I would go too far, they would pull me back. That's the and best kind of relationship, isn't it? With actors, it was like they they no 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 no. This is not your concept, yeah. Paul. Yeah, we. <laughs> this is what you mean, and it was. And they were right. They were always right. And and uh, what a what a joy to be schooled by your actors about the direction. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, I couldn't agree with you more. <laughs> For me, it's the happiest times in rehearsal are when those things they 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 can speak with candor and passion about what they are convinced is is the right way for me to direct this moment <laughs> yeah. yeah don't be changing steinbeck we revere steinbeck <laughs> don't be changing steinbeck <laughs> yeah. to hear that from your cast wow let's wow. look at some photos of our two productions just to um just to compare there there are certain similarities i suppose and certain um differences this is uh, this was designed by michael jurgen this is the westport playhouse production beautiful isn't it nice yeah i i love it because it's if this is the barn, obviously, but you get this sense of the 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 sun is always beating outside, and right. I love the I love the uh, porous wall. Yeah, the light streaming through. That's that's gorgeous. It worked very well, and that was Curly's wife. And now this is your production, right? And that and 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 there's Curly who's just been struck by Lenny, and the th and three of the three of the Latinx uh, workers are dealing with him, mm -hmm. and you, you've got. Gino Montesinos, who's uh, all of them, all of them are so great. I, 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 mean, I really, and now, now you've got David Neronia and Al Espinoza as George and Lenny eating beans the night before they get to the farm. The farm, right? right. Yeah, I, you know, it was we um, we didn't want to waste a moment. So this is this is while the set is changing. I wondered what this was. I couldn't. And, yeah, and and it basically it was a moment to uh to i i basically i i kind of love it when you can fill in something in the seams that that uh basically ex explicates the story so this is the workers actually having fun playing horseshoes uh-huh and you've got curly with his wounded arm watching them and here's the boss you now see here's what here's what's interesting so the boss is already doesn't like the workers <laughs> very much uh, to begin with in the play, but it, here he's asking them for their papers. Right. And, and this was something that because the Bracero program, you didn't work for anyone unless you had papers. So he's greeting them. We didn't change a line, but he's not taking them in till they show him his papers. And he laughs at the fact that his name is Lenny because it, 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 it we didn't change again. We didn't change a line, but the spin on it changed because when he said, my name is Lenny Small, the joke is usually because of small, because he's anything but small. Mm -hmm. But in our production, the joke is he's taken an anglicized name and that's how, the, that's how Josh Clark as the boss is reacting. Like, wow, not only, not only are you named small, but you're Lenny Small. 
That's quite that's quite a name to take for yourself. What's your real name? Oh, that's just yeah. brilliant. So, the, so the sub so the subtext becomes it's it's the play and more. I think. Yes, absolutely. I I think that's brilliant. Well, this is one of the one of the real perks of being an artistic director. Let me tell you, is that you get to have conversations like this with other people who do what you do, direct actors and direct plays, and I. I am so grateful, Paul, that you've taken the time to chat with me today about that beautiful production that clearly was tremendously meaningful, especially in Pasadena, California. And um, I know you're headed to Moscow to teach. Good luck with all of that. Thank and you. Thank you. Thank you very, very much from the bottom of my heart for, for being with us today. I think our audiences will love hearing about how you directed that play, how you conceived it, and, and uh, how you feel about theater in general. So. Bless you. Thank you, Mark. I appreciate it. Thanks for asking. <laughs> <laughs>